Welcome to another Wacky Sound Education. Today we're taking a fast and furious tour of the Behringer PMP4000 powered mixing board. My objective in this video is to educate you on all the cool features of this mixing board and make sure that all that fancy functionality doesn't confuse and frustrate you. My hope is that if you find that something is not working as you expected, You'll come back and review this short video to discover the pilot error that you are committing. Ha ha ha. I am assuming that you know how mixers work in general, and if you don't, that you will have viewed my video entitled Get on the Bus, so I'll not be going into long explanations of the basics, but will just be pointing out the unique and cool features of the Behringer 4000. Okay, hang on to your hats here. We're going to take a 20 second tour of the mixing board. In this area is the place where you have the input jacks, then we have the channel controls. From there the mixed signals go over to the master EQ section. We have the effects processor, then the master output volume controls, and that sends a signal out to the output jacks which are located in two different places. We got output jacks for the powered output and jacks for the unpowered output. I'll explain important features in each of these sections one at a time. Starting with the input jack section, each of the eight mono channels have either an XLR input or a quarter inch jack. But as you well know, you should never plug an eighth inch and an XLR into the same channel at the same time. There are four stereo channels and they have either quarter inch or RCA input jacks. And for these four channels, there is a difference in that they have an AB switch, which controls the input source. So don't let that confuse you. Set it appropriately depending on which jack you're using. While we're discussing the stereo input jacks, I'd like to show you that the volume control for the first two stereo inputs are slider type of controls and are labeled the same as the jacks, namely, the first stereo input is labeled 9 and 10, and the second is labeled 11 and 12. The second two stereo inputs are controlled by knobs in the middle of the board and are labeled 13, 14, and 15, 16. And finally, there is a fifth location for inputting stereo signals. It's located here, and the volume control for it is located on the very far right. This is a very special input for the following reason. This channel has a magic ability to remove the vocals from any piece of music. Let me demonstrate how that works. That's with the voice in. That's with the voice removed. Pretty neat feature. Great feature for the worship leader who wants to use an instrumental soundtrack. If he has a regular CD with a performer's voice in it, he can subtract that voice and then overlay his own in a live performance. As we move to the channel controls, the initial setting that must be adjusted correctly is the very first dial that the signal hits, the gain or the trim dial. And here's how you do it. During rehearsal, one channel at a time, with the singer or instrument playing at a relatively loud volume, press the magic pre-fader level button, PFL. This routes the channel signal immediately after the EQ section to the signal strength meter on the right. Now all you have to do is adjust the gain until it is just peaking into the yellow when the singer or instrument hits a really loud note. Make sure the signal never hits the red or the signal will be distorted. This PLF button works whether the channel is muted or not. Next in the sequence for a single channel adjustment is the EQ. You can and should try to adjust the channel EQ by listening to the house speakers back at the mixing board. However, there is a much better way to take a crack at improving the quality and clarity of the sound using the EQ. It is the PFL to the rescue again. 
When you engage the PFL button on a single channel, not only does it route the signal to the meter, it also routes it to the headphones. So while the entire band is ripping it up with a cacophony of sound, you can put on the headphones and listen to each channel separately. While listening, you can adjust the EQ to your liking. Super cool audio tech magic. Don't pass up utilizing this great feature. And also, don't tell anybody else about this little secret, okay? The mute button is an important button in each channel. It allows you to kill the output from that channel using a single press of the button. Utilize this button when microphones are not in use to prevent feedback and to avoid clanging sounds as people lay down their microphones. And it's also used to avoid the big pop, which can occur when guitars and other instruments are being plugged in or unplugged. The AUX1, AUX2 effects and house volume controls are all self-explanatory. The master EQ is where you adjust the EQ for the mixed sound. A few special buttons here. The EQ button itself turns the EQ on or off. The main monitor button lets you apply the EQ to just the main output or just the monitors. And the FBQ button. That stands for Feedback EQ. When this button is pushed, the red LEDs on the sliders become a poor man's spectrum analyzer. As sound comes through the system, any frequency that becomes very loud will light up the light on the corresponding button for that frequency. Let's take a look at several examples. First is my voice in a microphone. Test 1, 2, test. You can see the frequency range where my voice is. It's in that 160 to 400 range. Next, let's listen to a recorded song. Finally, if a microphone is resulting in feedback, these lights help you identify what frequency is causing feedback and let you pull down that frequency and eliminate the feedback. That's a pretty cool and useful feature. The effects processor has lots and lots of options. You pick the option you want by turning the big knob to the desired number and then click it by pushing it in to have the effect that you've dialed in take effect, so to speak. Then we've got the FX button which turns the effects on and off. And you can see here we've got various dials that allow us to send the effects to various buses. Regarding the output, there are two types of output. There's powered and there's unpowered. I'll discuss the powered output first and start by showing you the output jack locations. The internal power amp produces 800 watts per channel and drives speakers that are connected to the jacks on the back of the board. The jacks are speak on type of connector. Since our current speaker wires are quarter inch pins, we have an adapter that converts from speak on to quarter inch. You connect the speak on adapter by inserting it into the keyed slot and twisting about one eighth of a turn until it clicks into place. Then you can insert the quarter inch jack into the adapter. To remove the speak on adapter, you must first slide back the locking clip before rotating the adapter counterclockwise. Note that the minimal impedance per channel is four ohms. Do not, I repeat, do not daisy chain speakers together without consulting an experienced audio tech. If you do, you could damage or destroy the board. The two powered output jacks can get their signals from different sources and this is determined by a very important switch. Heads up, this is a very important piece of information that may throw you off on this board. This button is called the output mode switch and it is a tiny innocuous looking thing cleverly hidden at the top of the output section.
As you can see, there are three options. The first is stereo, where the left and right channels are 800 watts each, and the source is the main mix only, and the volume is controlled by the slider labeled main one. The left and right volumes are controlled by the individual channel pan knobs. The second choice is mono and monitor, which also has 80 watts per channel. Right is the monitor mix and left is the mono mix. And then you can see here that there are sliders for the monitor one and mono. And finally, the third choice is called the bridge. And in this mode, 1600 watts is pumped out to the right channel only. You typically would use this in a place where you got to have a lot of power to drive a huge speaker. We are not planning on using that in our facilities. The unpowered output is at line level, which is about 7 to 14 volts, relatively low power, and it comes from the jacks that are in this section. You can see there are jacks for main 1, a left and right, main 2, a left and right, mono mixes for aux 1 and aux 2, and an effects end and a headphone jack. The following is the way these jacks are used. You run a line from these jacks to either a speaker that supplies its own power or the line runs to a standalone amp which then drives unpowered speakers. Our community has some powered speakers so we have the option of running the sound from these monitor jacks and then to a powered speaker in a separate listening room. And one last tip about preserving the health of this mixing board. The amps have fans that draw in cool air and vents under the bottom that expel the hot air. Do not block the fans or the exhaust vents. Be careful to not place the mixing board on a thick towel or rug or tablecloth. Thanks for watching another Wacky Sound Education. This lesson has been on the Behringer PMP 4000 mixing board.